Welcome to DeFind, the podcast making the most important projects in crypto easy to understand and accessible to all. This week, we speak to Balancer, who describe themselves as a non-custodial portfolio manager, liquidity provider, and price sensor. Solar Curve, welcome to DeFind. Do you want to just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and how you got into crypto? Yeah, um, Solar Curve, I got into crypto middle of 2017 when Ethereum was really popping off and a lot of money was being made. I was trading traditional finance instruments at the time and saw the opportunity in crypto. And once I got in and started trying it out for myself, you know, I was quickly hooked and stayed through all the ups and downs since, uh, did really well in the summer of 2020 was really early using all the DeFi infrastructure because I've been a long believer of like on-chain presence and that's the future. So it's like, as soon as I could start doing stuff on chain, I just only did that and didn't use, you know, Coinbase and Binance as soon as I could get rid of them. So yeah. really early, really early user of on-chain infrastructure and yeah, Balancer caught my eye because at the time Uniswap required you to provide liquidity half token half ETH, but I didn't yeah. want to hold ETH. I wanted to go full DGEN, bunch of tokens, you know, and Balancer was great because I could put eight tokens in a pool and I didn't have to have ETH if I didn't want to. So that was revolutionary. And yeah, I could also set a higher fee and like really tax the arbors and stuff. And that just fascinated me a lot. So I uh, just kind of stuck around in Balancer ever since and contributed to the community early on. I, I, uh, designed a pool explorer for Balancer V1 called pools.vision that kind of got me interfaced with the team a little bit. And yeah, just been a really active part of Balancer's community since, and I guess even more active over the last year or so as the community presence has generally grown, but that's pretty much my crypto story. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really good. Um, and so what, how would you sort of describe your role now within Balancer? Yeah, I'm uh, <clears throat> on the community side, we recently made a funding proposal. We call ourselves the Balancer Maxis. So just like a group of uh, passionate community contributors, we handle a lot of tasks, like uh, we'll help you create pools, we'll add pools to the UI, we will add tokens to the UI, we'll add gauges, we'll add new token rewards to gauges. So we have a lot of responsibilities and yeah, we, we do a little bit of everything, anything that it takes to help Balancer function more effectively. And we're also ambassadors for Balancer and the broader DeFi. You know, we'll spread the word. We'll help projects understand Balancer, how to take advantage of Balancer. And a little bit of everything is really the answer. Okay. That last bit's very useful, leads me neatly into the next part. Um, so if you were at a dinner party and you were trying to talk to somebody, explain to them who's quite new to crypto and explain to them how Balancer works and what the project does. How would you go about that? Yeah, so I think the most relatable thing for most, you know, people understand ETFs. So like you think of the S&P 500, if you're in the United States, you know what that is. And there's an ETF, SPY, everybody knows it. You can buy it, you get exposure to the 500 companies in the index. But, in it, you know, in exchange for that, you pay them a little bit of a fee and in that they use that fee to manage the index, you know, rebalance the weight of the different companies, blah, blah, blah. So that all happens and you don't worry about it, but you pay to make it happen. So Balancer offers the opportunity to flip that. So like you can pick the tokens that you want to own and the weights that you want them to have in your portfolio. And then you, you create a Balancer pool, just like you would buy an ETF. This pool is effectively your ETF now. But instead of you paying a fee to other people, they are paying you the fee when they balance things for you. Right. So like you're earning the fee that you would be paying to a traditional asset manager. So it flips the whole concept on its head and you can create your own ETF with whatever you want in there. And so it's, yeah, it just puts the power back to the individual versus in traditional finance, you know, you're, you're offloading that to these huge corporations. So. Did you say it's up to eight tokens you can have in one of the pools? Right now, the limit is eight, but soon 
more pool types, more advanced te uh, pool types are coming that will dramatically increase them. Though. Yeah, cool. So that gives you a lot of flexibility then with what you can do with these things, yeah? Exactly, yeah. But most of the usage is still two token pools, three token pools. Yeah. That's yeah. what DeFi is used to from Uniswap, but... Yeah, always better to have a, a, a wider a wider choice. So when doing a bit of research for Balancer, I found a lot of pretty complex terminologies. And I was wondering if you could go into a little bit of detail on what these things are, like try to simplify them. So would you be able to give me a bit of an explanation on an n-dimensional invariant surface? <laughs> <laughs> Simplifying the incredibly complicated, but I, I think the heart of what you're asking here is like, uh, you know, there's different pool types, balancer supports, and that's one of the great aspects of our flexibility. Like Uniswap V2 is just 50 50 pools, and Curve is just stable pools. Mm -hmm. But balancer, we have weighted pools, which is the 50 50 variant from Uniswap, but extended to up to eight tokens in whatever weights you want. That's called a weighted pool. That uses a specific pricing curve, which is the invariant. And then the stable pools, they use a different pricing curve. And that's what allows for the very efficient swapping of you know, assets that are priced the same, like you see on curve with the stable pools and everything. So the great thing about Balancer is you can design your own invariant with your own price curve and make right. your own type type of pool you know and that's the cool thing and there's projects like element and sense that are using that are using that technology for fixed uh, like separate fixed yield from variable yield and so there's a lot of use cases out there for balancers flexibility yeah it sounds very flexible so you recently launched your ve tokenomics is that right we did yes it's basically a one to one copy of curve system so if you're not familiar with that, what that means is effectively you will lock up some BAL. In our case, uh, we ask you to supply liquidity to the BAL ETH 8020 pool. And then that liquidity is what you would lock for up to one year. Now, the reason you would do that is you now receive protocol revenue and the ability to vote on which pools get BAL emissions every week. So every week we're printing 145,000 BAL and giving it away to you know, liquidity providers. Now, how do we choose where that goes? Well, that's what VE ball voters decide. So the power to direct emissions and the earnings from the protocol are, the, you know, and then so you lock for a year to get these benefits. And the reason you need to lock is, so the year round for the consequences of whatever your decisions are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that was the beauty of Curve System. You align voters with the outcome of these votes. So they're incentivized to be voting for good things because their money is on the line for an entire mm -hmm. year, you know. Is it exactly the same as the Curve system? Or is there a, a difference between the way There's that two big changes. The first is curve locks for a maximum of four years, and ours is limited to one year because we thought four years in crypto, it's not just one lifetime, it's a few lifetimes. So lowering that to a year gives you know a lot more visibility uh, and less opportunity costs to people looking to participate. And the second change was that Curve, you lock CRV directly, just the token. And for us, you need to lock BAL ETH liquidity, 80% BAL, 20% ETH. And so this has a, a lot of advantages, but the main one being we have very, very deep BAL liquidity that we don't have to pay for because people have to deposit in there to lock. So it's a beautiful thing. Like yeah. BAL is a very, very liquid token because of that. So now that we've got a pretty good all-round understanding of what Balancer is, could you tell us a little bit more about like your goals, like why why we are doing this with Balancer and what sort of things we're trying to achieve with it. Yeah, so when Balancer <clears throat> first came out in the summer of 2020, you know, there was on-chain trading was really taken off and you could make a lot of money from swap fees, just like making your own pool and then sitting back and watching the money roll in. But nowadays, 
swap fees are a lot lower. So, and there's a lot of competition. Like Uniswap has huge market dominance, and aggregators have been slower to take off. So, most liquidity is just flowing through Uniswap, and Balancer mostly just sees arbitrage trading. So, when faced with this market dynamic, uh, you know, Balancer recognizes our place and that our flexibility is, you know, it enables more use cases than just traditional Uniswap style trading. So it doesn't make sense for us to compete with Uniswap when they do one thing very, very well. And we can do so much more than, than they can. So our, like the way I think about Balancer, my personal opinion is that we're more of an asset manager, not an AMM. So like you shouldn't think of us as a sushi or a curve or a Uniswap. You should think of us as an asset manager where people are going to park their assets and then like they're going to, you know, programmatically rebalance depending on what the parameters of the pool that they deposit in. But like we're a platform for asset management and we like we're pivoting also towards yield bearing tokens as well, like stake ETH that earns a yield and like uh, stable coins that are deposited to Aave and they earn a yield called boosted pools. Like we want to see more yield bearing tokens and we want to mm -hmm. take a fee on that yield and get away from solely relying on swap fees and turn into an asset management platform where people deposit yield bearing tokens that are programmatically rebalanced. We take a fee on that yield and swap fees can go to zero and that's fine. We don't care. <laughs> yeah, because you're getting it elsewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Very clever. So you said it's been you've been around since 2020, right? Middle of 2017. Mid oh, right. Middle of 2017. Even better. Um, <laughs> apart from the obvious, what sort of things have you seen change? What are the biggest changes in the crypto space that you've seen over that time? Yeah, I mean, the bear market was very long and difficult, and I think. The future of crypto was a lot more uncertain in 1819 than today. Like even you know, you could say we've seen a similar decline, but is the future of crypto in question as much as it was back then? I would argue absolutely not, because of everything, all the use cases we've unlocked and all the incredibly smart talent we've got in crypto that we didn't have four years ago. Uh, I don't have any doubt that crypto will come back this time. And last time, like, yeah, I was really wondering if I had made some very bad life decisions. <laughs> but uh, the bull market, I think, changed a lot. Like early on in 2021, I was very jaded and not liking a lot of the things I saw and the rise of these Ponzi's that just make no sense. But because it's a bull market there, they can thrive and grifters that prey on that kind of activity and uh, you know so actually the bull market was kind of not a super happy period for me because i just didn't like a lot of what i was seeing but we've flushed a, a dramatic amount of that out in the last two months so mm -hmm. i actually feel kind of a lot more optimistic now than i did uh yeah recent history well i guess that's one of the few pros that a bear market has is that it kind of clears out the weeds. It clears out the projects which are just there for like a, a quick fix, like a short term kind of thing. And it enables the stronger ones to, to, to grow, to flourish. Yeah, exactly. You know, crypto is so much of a black box to a lot of people. So it's so easy for you to get taken advantage of as a new crypto user by people that are, you know, selling you stories and you buy into it because you don't know any better and you've now learned some very hard lessons if one of those stories was Terra or Celsius. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I'm I'm relatively new to crypto. Um so this will probably be my first bear market. Have you got any tips for how to survive? Any tips for how to stay positive? Yeah, I mean Basically, the last bear market, I mostly, I, I mean, I traded here and there, but I just focused on non-crypto things. You know, I, I stayed up with what was happening, but activity died down to a certain point where, like, I didn't have to spend eight hours a day keeping up. So, I, you know, I worked out, got in pretty good shape, <laughs> found like some prison. other things to do. Yeah, <laughs> sort, of like, sort of like prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, great. So I'll, uh, I'll bear that in mind. Um, but nowadays, I think it's, I mean, there's other things you could do now. Like you can still be farming now. You're not going to get rich. But I think just continuing to use crypto 
uh, is the best advice I would give because like I kept using it in the last bear market and I got Uniswap airdrop, I got one inch airdrop, I got curve airdrop, like you go down the right. list, but like you don't know what you're going to get in the future. And plus you should be making money using this stuff anyway, even if it's not as much as it was six months ago. So continue yeah. using it, continue being engaged. That's absolutely the best advice. Cool. I'll, I'll definitely enact that. With regards to Balancer, what have been some challenges that you have faced? What things have you found kind of difficult to overcome? And, and then how have you managed to overcome them? Yeah, you know, Balancer, I think our flexibility is a great strength, but with that flexibility comes an unclear, you know, strategic vision because we can do so many things which one should we choose to do? And mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I had to point to one thing, I think that would probably be Balancer's biggest challenge because if you're at Sushi or Uni, you know what your job is. You are an AMM, get people to trade on you. <laughs> it's yeah. very simple. Balancer, we got a lot of different options. And I would argue, you know, this debate, I mean, it was it started when I, ever since I've been there, the argument, like a, a classic argument I've had is uh, low fees or high fees. Because if you get a lot of trading volume, like direct trading volume, like low fees are great because pe traders like that. But if you don't get any direct trading volume and you're purely arbitrage, should you be taxing the arbitragers just to make more money? Like why have a low fee just to give them a break <laughs> when you can have a higher fee, you make more money, they pay more to use you, and it doesn't hurt traders because you don't have so many traders to hurt. And I made that argument, you know, over a year ago. Uh, but at the time, we still believe, like, oh, no, we're going to get traders. Oh, no, we're going to get traders. We got to keep fees low. Mm. So when the traders come, they're happy, you know. But uh, <laughs> so it's philosophies like that. But, you, you know, it's because of balancers' flexibilities. Sushi only yeah. has one fee. That's it. They can't change that. So there's if no debate. If you can only kind of build in one direction, then that kind of, at least you're targeted. You don't have to consider all the different options where we could go this way, we could pay more attention to this sort of area. But yeah. Yeah, can... precisely, exactly. And even more recently, the debate on, we have a new pool type called managed pools where you'll be able to control what the pool does. Like it'll be able to rebalance according to certain parameters, uh, whatever parameters you want. And so... This could be a very, very powerful use case. For example, index funds that want to rebalance according to a preset set of parameters, they could use a managed pool to do that. But the market for DeFi indexes is microscopic today. You know, people just don't use them really. So mm -hmm. does it make sense to spend a bunch of our engineering power on this use case that today is very tiny? But yeah. in the future, it could be great, uh, you know, because we have the capability to do that, we we have that debate, which is a great thing, I think. It's about, I guess, it's about deciding whether to kind of deploy that power to it now for a later benefit, or whether to wait until, because you don't want to wait until it's too late and get front run by somebody else, I suppose. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think being early is critically important. Like you need to see where the market is going a year or two from now. Which I mean, in crypto, is very very difficult, but you need to balance that with short-term flexibility and not being married to an outcome that is never going to happen and you die because of that you yeah know, you've got to be flexible enough to adapt to what's coming but you also need to have an idea of where things are going and try to get there first yeah it's tricky so where do you think things are going in the next one to two years what would your uh your, your main guess your big theory be i think the recent trend of you know, since DeFi started until now, swap fees are going to continue to get less and less protocols that rely on swap fees for earnings, like all the all the DEXs, including Balancer today. It's just going to be more and more of a struggle. You're going to earn less and less. Like That's why owning these tokens is not so interesting to people because they rely on swap fees and swap fees are going to zero. There's really no debate about that. So I see pivoting to yield bearing is critical to our, you know, strategic success, just 
because our competitors can't really do this like we can. We have the boosted pool technology that they don't have, mm -hmm. and we can apply, like we can turn almost any pool into a yield bearing token as long as it has like an Ave market or a urine vault, somewhere where we can deposit it to earn a yield and then withdraw it with you know no friction. That's what enables it to be possible. So we could earn a bunch of free yield on all the assets on Balancer. We could take a fee on that yield and it doesn't bother the users because they're all there for BAL rewards. You know, you're not depositing for swap fees or like the 1% yield on Aave, you're depositing because you're getting the 5% BAL. So we shouldn't pretend it's anything but that, you know, we'll give you BAL, you put your money here. What's the most effective way we can use your money to make balancer money? Well, yield bearing, yeah, it's yeah. very simple. What are you excited about moving forward? Yeah, I mean, other than the balancer stuff, which near term, that's what I'm excited about. But I uh, I also follow, you know, everything I can. So I think I'm excited for the crypto games. We're going to see like Alluvium. I've been following them for a long time. I want to play a video game that has crypto that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. That's that's uh, so I think that's what we're all searching for. Yeah, um, and the other big theme would be the rise of layer twos like Optimism and Arbitrum and all the zk sync uh stuff we'll see. I think the layer one alternate layer ones really had their time in the sun in this bull market, and the next wave is going to be these layer twos taking off, I think. and the share of Ethereum transactions are going to just trend more and more towards being settlement for these L2s versus direct, you know, Ethereum usage. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about the future of those. Yeah. Do you play a lot of crypto games? No, man. I used to play a lot of video games, period. I played years of World of Warcraft and Dota, and I used to just stay, you know, I'd, I'd do some trading, but mostly I'd just be playing video games. <laughs> crypto is like, the best video game there is you know it's a oh, lot yeah, of yeah. it's got a lot of the dynamics of a game but there's money on the line and that's why it's so fascinating to me and i can spend so much time on it so mm -hmm. i don't play so many games anymore unfortunately just because what's the point when i could just be doing crypto <laughs> exactly. like read yeah, something yeah. Yeah, you know, so. I feel like we could have a we could have a whole other episode on gaming. Might have to get you back for another one. But yeah, I feel that. I feel like um, I haven't used my console since I got into crypto, since I started doing this job and stuff. So I, I feel your pain there, man. Yeah, I got the I got the same thing. My PS4 is gathering dust on the counter. But I mean, the rise of play to earn and then its subsequent collapse was also fascinating to see. Like Axie, you know, took off hard, and then that caused Alluvium to take off hard and all the others. And now that dynamic is totally unwound in the spare market. Like nobody mm. can make money playing Axie anymore. And <laughs> it's like, was it just a flash in the pan or is there actually something there? You know, it'll be very, it's a very interesting question. I guess we'll see. I think it's a similar thing to what we spoke about with the bear market kind of weeded out the lower quality projects. I think that also applies to the gaming sort of thing. Because I think we are seeing a lot of things like that in, in Blackpool in particular, in the things that we're in, investing in. The ones that are really coming to the surface now are the ones that have really... Uh, the, the, the crypto element is almost an afterthought to the actual gameplay and the quality of the service they're providing. So, yeah. What's, what sort of projects do you think will survive the bear? What do you think is going to really come out mm. on top? Any kind of hot tips or ones to watch? Yeah, I mean, I would... I think the original DeFi stuff, like uh, Balancer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, also, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. But the stuff like Aave and Wi-Fi, I think those those would be, like, if I think about what I'd love to own a bunch of at these prices, it's it's those kind of things. And I, But I also think a Yield Guild or something like that is also quite interesting because it's, it's very, very cheap now. And mm -hmm. if even a fraction of what they plan to do comes to fruition, games become a, a thing and they're not dead. It could could be pretty interesting. And also, I, I mean, I think Optimism, the token is also a very interesting, cheap play on the growth of L2s. Like if you believe Optimism is gonna be a significant L2 and Ethereum is not gonna go to zero, then 
that seemed like a very interesting bet to make as well. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll have a go on then. I'll look into it. But the safest thing is just ETH, of course. Like ETH is guaranteed to come back, I think. It's only a matter of time. The rest yeah. of this stuff is like, if you want to be a speculator, which which I am in my nature a speculator, so I'd rather own all those other things than ETH. But <laughs> Yeah. I think it's good to... Um... Definitely good to do a little bit of both. I don't just want to. It's boring to be completely safe and terrifying to be completely risky, for me anyway. Yeah, um, yeah I agree. So I think I've pretty much covered all of the questions that I've got written down here. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about a bit more? Like maybe some new products or features from Balancer that you want to shine a bit of a light on? Yeah, sure. So boosted pools. I think I mentioned them a few times, but. They are something I think you're going to hear more about over the next few months. And basically how they work is, you know, you tip, you think of your regular stable pool, DAI, USDC, and USDT. You put your tokens in there, you earn swap fees, maybe you're farming BAL, end of story. But the boosted pool adds another component in there where we deposit those three tokens to Aave, like 90% of the balance. So it's earning the Aave yield. And then the 10% is still used to trade. So you still get the same swap fees you already get, but in addition, you get the yield from Aave. So it's a very powerful mechanism you know, to increase capital efficiency for everybody who's providing liquidity. And right now, we just have the one, the Aave-boosted stable pool on Ethereum. But over the next six months, we're going to be expanding this to a lot more pools, a lot more assets on all the layer two networks. That'd be yeah, a great opportunity to get this technology in the hands of more people, more users, more projects. And then a next thing after that is managed pools, which I also talked about a little bit, but basically sort of like a smart pool, like back on Balancer V1, we had smart pools and this is the next iteration. Program the pool to do certain things, like if say ETH, goes down a bunch, maybe you want to program it to buy more ETH. And if ETH goes up a lot, maybe you want to program it to start selling or something like that. But whatever parameters you want to imagine, you'll be able to program that in and it'll happen automatically. You know, so the use cases of this are, you know, limitless. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just barely getting started. So the next five years, I think managed pools could be a massive game changer, but it'll be slow because it's a very complex product so it'll take a lot of time to get it going but long term i'm very very excited about it you it's complex behind the scenes but you want to make sure that it is the way that you've described it sounds like ideal for someone that's relatively new like me for example if you can set all these parameters then you don't have to be constantly watching the markets and making those decisions when you've already got something set up that can do that for yeah, you exactly yeah, there's yeah. an old an old thing, which those in the bear market probably remember, token sets, and they had like RSI sets, like ETH, ETH and stables. It would either be in ETH or in stables, depending on if the RSI was below 30 or above 70 or whatever it was. So like those things were very, very popular because they would buy when ETH was cheap. And then when they perceived it to be expensive, they would sell. And so like, it's a pretty cool little thing. And we'll be, you can make something like that with a managed pool. It's very simple, but... Yeah, I'm excited to get it into the hands of everybody and see what people come up with. Well, I think I've got everything we need there. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, thanks for having me, Ben. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. No, oh, nice one, man. Thank you for thank you for coming on. Thanks again to Solica for coming on and giving us a nice breakdown of Balancer. We'll see you in the next episode. Mm-hmm.